this. Confidence, competence, and community cooperation. <coughs> Before I introduce our keynote speaker, I want to thank everyone who has put so much into making this conference happen. The partners in this conference have been the West Kootenai Women's Association, Selkirk College, and Shaw Cable. And the funding came from the Ministry of Women's Equality under their Stopping the Violence program. Particularly, I want to thank my co-organizers, Jane Burton and Bridie Morrison Morgan. Bridie's right up there. Thank me. <laughs> and Jane's out in the video van. Um, in the last few weeks, this conference has taken over our lives. And I cannot possibly convey to you the amount of work, dedication, creativity, and sheer determination these women have put into this endeavor. Well, I think I can say I dreamt this conference up. These two women made this dream come true. And then, of course, there's everyone else. What an amazing crowd of women we have in these communities. From the workshop presenters and speakers, to the daycare workers, to the video crew, to the women who came to the organizing meetings, to the many volunteers, to my ever-supportive co-workers at the Women's Center, to Gitta and Dalo who made these beautiful flower arrangements, and to all of you, a heartfelt thank you. We could not have done this without you. Now I have to wait for the video tape to be switched. At the uh, Simon Fraser Harbor Center, where there were four or five extraordinarily uh, competent, uh, primarily women uh, who had PhDs in geology, who were statisticians, and uh, who had done a lot of their research through the Caledon Institute, which is uh, uh, an alternative uh, research institute to the uh, Fraser Institute or the uh, C.D. Howe Institute. And that propagation of that myth about how these greedy geezers, and you and I are- <laughs> Well, I touched my head. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is a myth. And in fact, it's, it's so simple. I mean, how people can buy into that and then use it as a means of a leverage to cut back on seniors' pensions and on health care and on education, that's the, that's the way uh, that, uh, that, that, that voodoo economics is projected. And I just think we have to stand up and challenge that because there is certainly alternative research being done which totally discredits uh, what we're getting from uh, both the, the Fraser Institute and the C.D. Howell Institute. And I would guess that that uh, statistic came from one of those institutes. Well, thank you for sharing that, Margaret. And uh, when you read this information, just ignore that line. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it does give me, Margaret, it gives me some concern with our economy, uh, the way it is moving and uh, the numbers of uh, production jobs that are being taken over or being uh, performed by robots, et cetera, they're just, if, if I look at some of the demographics, and I don't necessarily believe Mr. Foote, okay, uh, <laughs> then there are fewer people working, contributing to whether it be Canada Pension or what have you, uh, to build that fund so that it will serve us all. I'm hopeful that there will be some adjustments, some changes. I think what happens is the change in one direction in our society far outstrips uh, what needs to be done in another section of our society, and, and, and it becomes difficult then to rectify it. But all you bright people here can help do that, okay? Yes, Mark. Just to add to that kind of discussion, I really highly recommend that people read the Little Plains new book. Right. Um, I heard her speak recently, and, and her economic analysis is very, very different, and yeah. I think one that is much more uh, reasonable and easily adopted by a, a philosophy that we would be able to support. I would hope that some of the best thinkers in the world are, are thinking about how governments are going to 
get their resources in the future because as we move further and further into this knowledge uh, based economy, it's a very difficult one to, to, to tax. And I think governments right across the world are wrestling with that now. Maybe they'll determine, maybe they'll determine they don't need so many taxes, which would be wonderful. Thanks, Mark. repeat the questions I could ask. Yeah, I was recently on a committee uh, that the city of Vernon appointed to look into the idea of constitutional money. And our recommendation was that this go to the UBCM, whatever we decided. And the council just refused, even though the committee uh, five out of six of us agreed that this idea should go to the UBCM. Um, briefly what the idea was, there's a group called Canadians for Constitutional Money and it appears that the reason we're becoming bankrupt uh, as a nation and many other countries as well is because the governments are now borrowing money from the banks at compound interest rates which the taxpayers have to pay back. And this is how they're bankrupting, uh, <clears throat> you know, unemployment insurance, Medicare, education, and that all we have to do is go to uh, Section 91 of the Constitution, which says that only the Government of Canada has the right to create money. And uh, so the Canadians for Constitutional Money are recommending that about half the money should be created by the government and half by the banks for the private sector. The half that the government creates should be lent out interest-free to municipalities. And they did this after the war, as a matter of fact. And uh, for some reason, the committee, although we agreed on this recommendation that it go to the UBCM, the council wouldn't do it. So. What do you do in a situation like that? And how does one get something to the UBCM? Well, uh, unfortunately, because the way our society is, good question, it's structured, it has to go through a municipality. But let me, let me say that municipalities in British Columbia have been pioneers in the cooperative model of borrowing money on behalf of municipalities I think since the early 70s, the Municipal Finance Authority is called, and it not only borrows money uh, collectively on behalf of regional districts and municipalities, and, and, and it gets, uh, because they borrow so much, they get a bulk rate, so they get a much lower rate of interest. They weren't content with just doing that. Then they decided that if they could talk to municipalities and have them all sort of aggregate their funds, their, their tax funds, that they would deposit them uh, with institutions at a more advantageous rate of return. That model has been uh, talked about, well, the Municipal Finance Authority of British Columbia has gone, been invited across to other provinces in Canada. They've been down in South America by invitation. They've been over in Europe by invitation. It's a wonderful model of cooperation, and I haven't answered your question. And, but I did, in essence, in saying the only way you get your, your resolution to the UBCM, because of the way it's presently structured, is through your own municipal council. So you have some lobbying to do there. The other thing, I don't know whether you know it or not, but, but again, I think the UBCM is a model in that instance. Uh, when, when insurance rates were going sky high in, in the 80s, uh, we at municipalities were seeing our liability insurance going way out of sight. And again, uh, some members of the executive pioneered uh, a whole, uh, an independent municipal uh, uh, insurance uh, uh, association where in essence, you pay a very reduced rate and you pay it into your own uh, municipal insurance uh, company and you actually get dividends. Is that right, Rosemary? Yeah. So, so municipalities have had some very interesting models of, of cooperation and, and uh, innovation. 
I, I was involved in some of them, okay, but not all of them. So this will have to be the last question, I think. So. It's actually a comment, and it's a challenge to Audrey. I, I thank you very much for uh, the um, role model that you have presented today and, give us, and given us that opportunity to get to know you a little bit better and uh, the feminist that you were at the forefront back to your university days. Uh, and you mentioned, Audrey, that uh, you feel that with 25% representation of women on various governance boards begins to affect some change. I would like to propose that, in fact, that amount gets increased to 50% and to that effect that a scholarship or some other me financial means is actually set up perhaps through the support of the Selkirk board, so that women who have um, economic barriers for that participation might be able to access such amount of funds. Well, I would say write us a letter. Uh, Hannah, I, you want 50%. Well, that, 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 we're 50% of the population. My 25% is we begin to make a difference then, uh, 25%. Um, scholarship? Uh, there are then, uh, there are uh, financial barriers to people doing these things. In, in, in your community or in the wider? I think generally speaking in the women's community, there are, there are certainly, you mentioned how you have to go into your own pocket for that 100% advertising. So it, it's those kinds of... A hundred dollars, yeah. I'm sorry, a hundred dollars. Uh, Costs a lot more these days. That's right. And, and equally so today, it is, it's, it's because of the... Uh, unemployment and the under, underemployment of women, that yeah. access to those types of funds to be able to move forward into yeah. is a huge systemic and structural barrier. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'll give that due consideration. You've been a great audience. Thank you very much.